All right. Okay. So I am pleased to introduce today uh, Dr. Ben Teolis. He's a physicist at uh, Southwest Research Institute, uh, physicist, experimentalist, and planetary scientist, uh, expert in planetary atmospheres and magnetospheres, as well as uh, chemical and radiation processes on the surfaces of icy bodies in our solar system. Um, he's also a co-investigator of the MassFex instrument on Clipper and uh, uh, has been working on the Cassini spacecraft, which doesn't exist anymore, but the data from it uh, for uh, over a decade. Uh, I'm, I'm going to cut the introduction short because we're running a little slow. Um, he's going to talk to us today about uh, a variety of gas dynamic plume flow kind of problems. All right. Thank you, David, for that kind introduction. Um, so I was uh, instructed today that I could talk about whatever I want. So uh, amidst a huge uh, number of possibilities uh, for different topics, different issues in which to discuss, I thought uh, talking about Enceladus and some of the other uh, observations that we made uh, with the moons and the Saturn system would be an excellent topic for discussion to illustrate the physics of a planetary system uh, with what we were able to do with Cassini over a very extended mission, all of the different instruments that we had on board and Saturn just being a very nice example of a system with moons of different sizes, masses, conditions, distances from the planet, in a magnetosphere, which as compared to some other planets in the solar system behaves in a relatively simple way. I'll drive some physics at some of the moons, um, which can really uh, tell us a lot about uh, physics of planetary systems in general. Uh, I know we have a very mixed audience here, so I thought I would just uh, very briefly uh, set up the scene here. So this is a diagram of Saturn, Saturn's magnetosphere, and you have uh, several large moons and Enceladus, which is a, a smaller object, uh, orbiting, uh, most of them orbit well within the inner magnetosphere, um, which is uh, rotating along with the planet Saturn. So you have this interaction of the moons and their surfaces with the magnetospheric plasma, uh, which erodes the surfaces and injects material from the surface. Um, and you also have tidal interactions between the moons, which can heat and melt the interiors and drive not only geologic processes and the heating of the interiors, but also chemical reactions in the interiors. And so for an object like Enceladus, where you have a liquid water ocean beneath the icy crust, a combination of that and heating of the uh, interior and of the core region, there's a possibility that you could have chemistry that may drive uh, conditions, be an energy source for habitability of the ocean. So that together with the physics of uh, Enceladus and of Enceladus's plumes, which we'll get to in a minute, how those plumes are created and what sort of windows plumes can give us on the um, source of um, the plumes, the depth of the crust and the chemical conditions of the ocean, which may possibly drive some sort of life in the oceans. Um, that's why we're interested to understand the conditions of those blooms. So here just is another diagram showing the distribution of uh, the moons and their relative distance from Saturn. You can see the main ring system there on the left side, Enceladus orbits within the diffuse E ring, which is actually a material created by the Enceladus plumes, which uh, establishes itself in orbit around Saturn. And then several larger moons uh, as you go further out, which I'll come to. <clears throat> so Enceladus, for those of you that don't know, um, is the surface is almost pure ice. It's a very bright object. Most of it is heavily cratered, so it's old, but this southern region of Enceladus is geologically active and young and is um, has these tiger stripes features, these cracks, which are parallel. Uh, there's four major ones that uh, span the southern terrain of Enceladus. And 
emanating from the cracks are jets of gas, water vapor, and uh, grains, ice grains, um, ejecting out of the surface. And so the source of that is um, liquid water somewhere below the surface. And so this is one of the indications, there are others as well, of uh, liquid water uh, below, but uh, relatively close to the surface, which serves as the source of these plumes. And so I'd just love to see these images there because uh, you can actually see, um, so the green line denotes the positions of the cracks, but we're looking at this glancing angle here in the sun. You can see the scattered sunlight uh, from the grains and these individual sources. So it's not a smooth emission along the tiger stripes, but you've actually got, um, I guess it's hard to see here in the light, but you kind of see some here, these individual spots along the cracks where emissions appear to be taking place. And so we were interested to understand the properties of those emissions, the ejection speed, the ratio of gas to ice, um, you know, and whether they're constant with time or changing with time. These things change with time between flybys. So that's one of the things we looked at as the Cassini spacecraft uh, conducted several close flybys through this region of Enceladus. And this is just another image here. And uh, there you can really see those, those discrete spots there. Um, and, you know, we have so few of these uh, visual images, not to mention uh, flybys when we're measuring the jets and the plumes that um, it's not completely certain whether um, these jets are changing or what's going on with those things. So there are missions under consideration to go back to Enceladus and orbit Enceladus. And if such a thing happens, we get an orbiter around there, for example, we get hundreds of flybys through these things. So we'll be able to map how they change with time and the distribution of these uh, jets across the surface versus the position in time. That will be uh, very interesting to see. There's another one as well. Look at how they e eject out almost as beams of the surface. Enceladus has um, very low gravity. Escape speed is 230 something meters per second, I believe, for me if I'm wrong. So it's not, it's not difficult to uh, exceed that with, with these jets. So the vast uh, majority of the gas as it's ejected continues uh, out in the Saturn environment and ejects out into space. And you can see here that with these collimated beams, not only um, are they apparently well in excess of the escape speed, so you don't see any visual indication there of stuff falling back. But the gas is uh, sufficiently cold and sufficiently fast. And when it ejects from these surface fissures, it's ejecting in a very forward-directed uh, angular distribution. So it's remarkable to see these, these beams there. And I believe what you're seeing in these ISS, uh, the imaging subsystem uh, instrument on Cassini, uh, is actually more the scattered light from the particles. So those are the ice, the ice grains embedded in the plume of gas, and they're being dragged along with it before the beams on the surface. Very different from some of the other uh, objects in the solar system, plumes, which have more gravity. So plumes in Io, Jupiter, possible plumes in Europa, um, you know, where material, most of that material falls back. Gravity is much more intense. So you get these structures and canopy shocks. This is a very different situation here with a much less massive object such as Enceladus. So this is some of the data that we uh, measured with the Cassini uh, ion neutral mass spectrometer. So we're flying through the plumes. Uh, this is sometime later after we discovered the plumes and altered the mission plan, be able to get down in there in the plumes and fly directly through them. And one of the goals was to use this instrument to see if we could discern uh, both the composition of the, the vapor in the plume, that's what the, the mass spectrometer measures, but also uh, variations in structure and the density of the plume as we're flying through it. 
And there you can see that there. These are three different close flybys. And um, you can see these bumps and features uh, as we're flying through, through the plume. The plume is water vapor, but we use um, CO2. So this is a measurement of CO2. The reason we do that is that the water vapor sticks in the instrument. So it gives a very distorted, um, it's, it hangs around in the instrument. So um, the, the signal that you see in the instrument doesn't track uh, perfectly the in situ density of the flying through. But some, there's CO2 in the plume as well. So use that as a proxy for the density of the gas. When you do that, you see these features, these bumps and features as you fly along here. Some of them are quite sharp. And I want to show an example of the implications of that here. So this is this is the E14 flyby. So that's uh, this red one here in the graph. And um, so this is a model where uh, with different jets along the tiger stripe. So we're able to constrain with the images the positions of some of the jets along the tiger stripes and put those into models of uh, the gas distribution uh, above the plume. So you have a jet, it's pointed in whatever direction and you, can, you have different models for uh, the spreading of the gas, the forward speed of the gas, the Mach number of the jet, which is um, the ratio of the forward speed of the gas to the thermal velocity of the gas as it comes out. So that determines the spread of the jets. So you can see here, this is what happens for different Mach numbers. A high Mach number are very uh, being like Pen, almost pencil-like jets and low Mach number, Mach zero is just pure isotropic emission of jets. And what is the prediction of the model? And what do you need to fit these features? And so actually you can see there that really none of the models fit the shape um, exactly because there are some parts of the, of the gas distribution that are very broad. And then there are these sharp features that you can't fit you know, with a low Mach number uh, solution. So it appears that the emission from the jet, as I drew it in that cartoon there and left, is um, a combination of different distributions. So you have this isotropic component, and then you have a much, much more forward directed component. What that means and what the physics of that is, um, I'm not sure, but presumably the, real, the high speed component represents perhaps narrow fissures where the gas is undergoing a significant amount of collisional expansion and acceleration as it comes up through the fissure and or liquid moving from below, boiling and undergoing acceleration by that means, a combination of those two processes of uh, liquid moving in the fissure, gas expanding that produces these high speed uh, components in the jets. But where the broad component comes from, you know, we still have to think about. So um, this is a heavily investigated problem, but still not totally well understood. And so we move on to, yeah, this guy. So. This just gives another example of how these models, so these models include a combination of these of the high speed component of the jets plus this broad profile. And um, these are the fits that we managed to get through the modeling of these of the different features. How to move the positions or the pointing directions of the jets, but what you have to do to get these fits to work is to change their intensity. Certain jets turn off, others turn on between flybys. Um, there was no solution uh, which was constant. All of the jets said intensities that did not change between flybys. You could not get a unique solution to all three flybys. So um, this is the fit to the CO2. This just shows uh, the water, what the prediction is which you actually see in the instrument. You can see again the effect of the fact that 
water vapor sticks in the instrument. You know, in hindsight, um, you learn things as you go through the mission. So one lesson you might take or something like this is here or something inside the instrument on a future mission to help the water uh, transmit through the instrument to perhaps reduce this problem. But anyways, this just shows uh, the effect that you get with the water. And this is a cross-section slice through a modeled uh, density of the plume. The, the dotted line is Cassini's trajectory and the white line is the representation of density to fly through. So, and you know, these, these are, we looked at a number of different models. Uh, what if you have jets? What if you have uniform emissions? There's this idea that uh, you could have a, a sheet or curtain-like emission, but we're trying to understand the, the structure of the, of the plume. And so there were a number of different models. And uh, so these Cassini flybys gave us an opportunity to really test the efficacy of these different models to understand the shapes that we were seeing. Uniform curtains, curtains that depend on the surface temperature of the tiger stripes. So the tiger stripes are warm compared to the surrounding terrain. Not only do you see these jets, but you see a thermal anomaly along the tiger stripe, tiger stripes. And so, um, and actually, that temperature varies on a local scale along the tiger stripes. I don't have the image here, but there's some real good um, from the Sears instrument where they would be. You may have seen them, they're measuring uh, close up to the tiger stripes and there are some, these localized, real localized hot spots within hundreds of tens of meters of what is presumably a, a gas source. So this gas or liquid and gas perhaps below the surface is traversing up from the ocean below at or above um, 273 Kelvin, the melting point of water moving up, perhaps the liquid is moving up through the crust and heating the, the crust in the regional around the tiger stripe. So, you know, one question is, by the way, in that whole process, how close does the liquid get to the surface? There's some possibility that the liquid reaches the surface, but we don't really know totally for sure. So I'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, David mentioned to me that some of you guys work on occultations. So I just wanted to show this as part of the studies we've been doing with the plumes were stellar and solar occultations as well in the distance to get a cross section of the column density through the plumes. So an instrument like the INMS is flying along with Cassini and looking at the trajectory just along the line of the Cassini trajectory. But the advantage of a column density measurement is you're slicing through all of these gas jets at once. So it gives an additional constraint on the jets. And so that image there is a, is a model. It's uh, one of the models uh, for the jets. And this is a column density. This is a column density projection from the model and the model fit to a solar occultation that we did with uh, Cassini. So you can see there, it's not perfect, but you can manage to fit some of these features pretty well. So I would say that we have a decent, but uh, very incomplete understanding of the distribution and level of activity and time variability of these jets. Um, and there again is the, the occultation results for different models. So I just wanted to show this. So you actually see two, you can, you can estimate two things from these flybys. One is the intensity of the total plume at the time of the flyby, and the other is intensity of the individual jets. And something that's been uh, observed uh, from a number of studies is the fact that the total plume appears to have this systematic variation with the position of Enceladus around Saturn as the tidal forces acting on the tiger stripes bring the tiger stripe cracks into tension or compression, depending on where Enceladus is. And there's this dependence on mean anomaly uh, position along the orbit. So we wanted to see if we could confirm that dependence uh, with the CNI IMS and the uh, UVS instrument that I was just showing, which is what we're doing. So you, the solar occultations. 
And so these are the results of that from the modeling. And you can see there that um, there's a lot of spread data. So it's hard to say whether that's certainty, but at least within the error bars, in the term of the year, uh, there may actually be some um, a bit of random variation in the total blue. But that's superimposed on top of this systematic variation here uh, by a factor of, I mean, it's pretty significant, factor four or five in the total intensity of the um, as it's selling this orbit. And, but then within that, as I mentioned, it appears that these jets are turning on and off. So, um, you know, we started with this picture of the plume as a kind of constant thing, but now it appears <laughs> it may be far more active and dynamic than perhaps we realized with jets changing. We didn't find any uh, pattern there that changes the jets with mean anomaly or anything, which just sort of seemed to be a random thing. So, um, We'll have to continue to think about what that means and try to understand it. So this is a picture of uh, a possible source or one possible mechanism for the source of these jets. So you have a liquid ocean below the crust and there may be cracks or uh, pathways through the crust where the liquid uh, will rise to a level Below the crust, and this is the this is one uh, proposed model where you have a, a subsurface chamber of some kind with liquid there in the, in the bottom that's presumably originating from the ocean below. And you have to keep in mind too that you know there's this uh, hydrostatic balance uh, between the liquid water and the ice that's floating above it, so to speak. You think of a uh, ice an iceberg or something on Earth, where 90% of it was submerged. That relative uh, submergence uh, is related to density of the ice relative to water. So it works uh, in a similar way um, if I have a crack or a fissure below the crust, where in hydrostatic balance, actually, um, the liquid, if it has a pathway to do so, will rise 90% you know, to the, to the top surface. So the crust is estimated to be um, five kilometers, 10 kilometers, something, something of a few kilometers, uh, perhaps 10 kilometers thick. So um, you do the math there. I mean, liquid could just from uh, the point of view of hydrostatic balance rise to at least several hundred meters below the surface it could be sitting down there with these fissures if it's at a, a static uh, point there below the surface. But anyway, so um, the liquid is in contact with the ice around it. So the temperature will be at or close to the melting point of ice. And um, the pressure above it, this is a approximately closed chamber. There's a small throat there on the top, but in conditions of equilibrium, the melting point, uh, freezing point of water. Uh, you're near the triple point of water where ice, liquid, gas uh, in equilibrium exists on the phase diagram together. And so at that point, the vapor pressure of water is 600 Pascals, its temperature is 270 Kelvin. And so uh, that's one way of looking at it. You have gas at this pressure, it expands through a constriction, a throat, and uh, undergoes cooling and collisional expansion, acceleration, and emerges from the surface as a cold gas with forward directed motion. So we converted the thermal energy of the gas into forward directed motion. And that's a way similar to a uh, rocket nozzle that you can produce a collimated beam that jets out into space. Um, another consideration. Also um, is the fact that, so this is a diagram of the fissure and these fissures undergo compression and expansion uh, as the crust sits on top of the ocean. So that will force liquid. So in compression, for example, liquid volume of the fissure can decrease and liquid is forced both down into the ocean and upward towards the surface. So depending on whether you're in compression or expansion can have 
um, periods where the liquid may uh, be in motion and move up to the surface. And it's interesting to think about um, how that works out if the liquid is in motion and under compression, um, you know, it presumably boils and it has this transition zone where it's transitioning from liquid into a gas. So, um, let's see my head here. So, this just gives an, an example of that. And so, it's an open question here. Uh, how, what is the correct way to think about this? One way you could think about it is uh, liquid is moving up through the fissure. Um, if you're very simple about this, you would set aside for now material exchange with the walls. So material can freeze to the walls, can be absorbed from the walls. If we set that aside, the volume expansion factor from a liquid to a gas, so liquid at the density of water to water vapor at 600 pascals is 200,000. It's estimated that um, the liquid may move through these fissures in a few hundred cent a few centimeters per second. So, um, you know, expanding that to a gas, conserving the flow, a few centimeters per second times a factor of 200,000 implies ejection speeds of 10 kilometers per second from the surface, which is quite fast, uh, especially as compared to the calculated speed for a stagnant gas, which expands and achieves its ultimate expansion speed um, as, a, as in a rocket nozzle. So you can get different answers depending on the way you think about it. And this is a ill-explored aspect, I think, of the physics. There's also uh, energy exchange, thermal exchange uh, between the walls and the liquid. There's material exchange. Uh, if the walls are cooling in this process, then liquid and ice may freeze to the fissures. So then the fissures close, and then what happens? Do they close and then burst open again? So, um, and you may have something like that. These fissures may close, block the, the pathway for the liquid to flow, and then something breaks against this lodge in there, and the fissures may open again. And, um, you know, the other consideration here is I'm only discussing in this context uh, pure water, but in fact, you have this is a saline solution. Cassini detects uh, salt concentrations in the ice grains that are ejected, and so um, there's salt in these things as, as well. And presumably, as the liquid is boiling, so boiling and freezing at the same time as it boils. That boiling process takes latent heat from the liquid, and you can create ice particles that way. Um, those particles will contain salts as well. How does that affect not only the physics of this expansion process, but the composition of the walls? Do the salts deposit on the walls? Um, you know, there's a plethora of questions here that are just beginning to be addressed, but I thought I'd bring this up because it just seems to me to be such a fascinating problem. So. Uh, and here's another aspect to this as well, which I find interesting, is that you have a, if you have a constriction, you know, we talk about uh, constrictions with gases expanding through the constriction and accelerating the rocket nozzle, but you have uh, constrictions down deeper in the fissure if there's liquid moving through the constriction as well. And so you can have things like cavitation where the liquid gets forced through uh, a fissure, and so you have a drop of pressure in the liquid, what can happen uh, is that the pressure will go uh, to be low, so it will get to a point where it goes below the, the vapor pressure of the liquid at that temperature, and you start getting bubbles of vapor forming in the liquid. And cavitation is interesting uh, in that it actually is a very destructive process. So these bubbles form, and then they collapse out here, bubbles collapse. And that creates a little shock in the bubble. Bubble undergoes a sudden, as the pressure drops and then recovers, the bubble undergoes a sudden collapse. You get this shock, um, which has the possibility of eroding the walls of the, of the fissure. That sort of thing is seen, um, seen in many different contexts. 
Uh, but for example, in uh, turbines, like in boats, the turbine spins too fast through the water. You actually can get this cavitation damage in the turbine. Um, so anyway, um, it's interesting to consider uh, what sort of thing might happen with uh, something like this happening down in where in the deeper in the fissure where the liquid has been forced uh, through the fissures. And then finally, um, in addition to these salts, you have dissolved gases in the liquid as well. So I mentioned that we see CO2, we also see hydrogen in the plume. And those things will come out of solution from the liquid at lower pressures than the liquid itself will boil. So even below this, this area where the liquid is itself boiling, you may have hydrogen and CO2 coming out of solution that may come move along with the flow stream and get ejected with the jets, but you can think about that there could be pockets or something inside the fissure where those gases uh, can become trapped in the subsurface pockets. Um, the pockets may be stable or they may accumulate gas and then suddenly release or burp out, so to speak, bubbles of hydrogen or, or CO2. So, so this is just, I was thinking about this problem and decided to do a little test simulation. Um, this is preliminary, but I programmed one dimensional equations taking into consideration um, the continuity of the flux, um, of the material flux. So this is liquid water. Uh, it's changing phase between liquid, solid, and gas. I'm injecting liquid on the left, and I'm solving equations for continuity, for force and momentum, and for heat exchange, uh, latent heat exchange between the two phases, between liquid, gas, and ice. And um, I can turn on also heat exchange with a brick wall. And I'm simulating the flow speed, the density and the flow speed of the different phases. And um, you can see here, you get this wave-like thing. So this is a kind of, uh, I'd say, one dimension manifestation of the water attempting to turn into vapor through the pockets of bubbles, perhaps boiling, or at least as the computer renders it, the context of a one dimensional equation, you have this kind of boiling thing that takes place. And the dark blue here is the speed of the gas. And you can see here that as I'm, let me start that again. So I'm injecting the, injecting the liquid from the left. This uh, boiling like process happens. It produces vapor and the speed of the vapor shoots up. And it again comes down to this uh, volume ex expansion effect that you have this uh, major acceleration of the, the, the gas. This is a preliminary thing. Um, I'm just testing uh, equations to see what sort of results I can get. But uh, I think this sort of thing, whether you continue to do it one dimension or expand it to three dimensions, uh, definitely worthwhile to pursue, not only to understand Enceladus, but to understand the physics of plumes in general on the, many of these objects. So um, I jump over, this is, Changing a little bit, but uh, I want to mention that in addition to the subsurface uh, physics of these objects and plumes, um, there's this question also of what sort of material, what uh, volatiles can you stick from the plumes on the surface as they eject from the surface? Now, I mentioned that in Enceladus, the gas beams are vast majority of the material ejects out into space. Um, but there is perhaps a possibility that you have some scattering of some of the molecules from the jets to the sides. So as the jet is ejecting, water or CO2 may scatter and some of it may form a condensate on the surface. But water will do that and the CO2 will do that. I'll just show this image of the, of the moon just to show um, an idea of what the surface temperatures are like on these objects at their poles um, when they're not exposed to the sun, exposed to space for long periods of time. So here at the moon, we achieve temperatures of uh, 40 degrees Kelvin at uh, the polar regions. And 
predictions for the Saturn satellites, uh, you make similar predictions. So this is a prediction for Rhea, which is one of the other moons of Saturn. Uh, this is the measurement, excuse me, measurement of Rhea on the right and Tepe on the left from the Cassini Sears instrument, which measures thermal infrared radiation from, um, from the surface. And these are some of the estimated temperatures. And Saturn is a seasonal system, so it's tilted to the sun at an angle of 26 degrees to the sun. And it uh, takes 29 years to orbit the sun. So it has these long 14 year uh, seasons with the poles, the polar regions of Saturn and its satellites sit in darkness and radiate out into space. That's what <laughs> Anyway, so um, you know the surfaces can get quite cold, and the question is whether on an object like Enceladus, some of the volatiles from the plumes could actually scatter and stick to the surface, and then when the seasons change, come bursting off at the surface, and the sun rises up the poles from forty degrees Kelvin, well cold enough to stick something like CO two to uh, 90 or 100 degrees Kelvin, which is what Saturn satellites achieve when the sun uh, shines back on the surface. So, and this is actually uh, some data from Enceladus too. This is the North Pole. Um, so the question is, you're gonna have to speak up. The question is um, away from the tiger stripes in the South Pole. Uh, if you have regions cold enough, uh, they can stick to, to the gas. So this is just a measurement, an estimate of the temperature of the North Pole during North Polar winter, seeing estimated for this infrared emission spectrum, um, the temperature of 37.5 degrees Kelvin. So um, that's unexplored. We don't know if, and you know, the southern polar terrain is in winter right now, but it's about to come into spring. I guess it's too late to see if we get an explosion of gas coming off the surface, but it would be fascinating uh, someday to take a look at that if we have. So you've got these constant blooms there, but you know, the surfaces are exposed for 14 years uh, to whatever material it's scattering from the plumes and sticking on the adjacent surfaces. So you get this temporary, we'll call it an exosphere because it's, the cell is just too small to gravitation bound the material, but it's, plume, this other plume, so to speak, which is not from the plumes, but from the material that was condensed, the CO2 that was condensed on the surface terrain around the plumes, that is just exploding off the surface. The reason why I say this is because we see examples of this very thing at the other moons of Saturn. And so, um, and at other objects as well. So actually, the first on the left here, this is, this is the moon, Earth's moon. And this is uh, uh, taken from the surface from Apollo lace instrument, argon density. Argon sticks to the surface of the at night. So um, as the lace instrument which is sitting on the surface measuring the pressure of argon uh, goes from day to night, it's measuring the ambient pressure around it. And the this ex thin exosphere of argon which is there during the day Surface gets cold at night and the exosphere freezes to the surface. And this sort of thing happens in the Saturn satellites as well, where the whole atmosphere will, depending on the surface temperature, the local surface temperature and the surface temperature of the poles, the atmospheric density can change drastically as it comes off and then freezes to the surface. Imagine if Earth's atmosphere collapsed like that, rose to the surface and came off. We don't have that here, but you have the drastic atmospheric or exosphere dynamics um, in the Saturn system. This is driven at Saturn. Um, <clears throat> so here you can see the measurements of, we measured oxygen and carbon dioxide from two of the Saturn moons, from Rhea, from Rhea and Dione. So Cassini uh, conducting close flybys of Rhea and Dione. Um, and we measured this with the neutral ion neutral mass spectrometer and measured neutral oxygen and carbon dioxide as we pass by during the closest approach. These exospheres are driven by Saturn's magnetosphere, 
nematospheric plasma pinches onto the surface, breaks up water molecules in the surface. You get solid state chemistry happening in the, sur in the surface where an ion or an electron will go in, break up the H2O, reactions happen inside the solid. You get hydrogen, which leaves, it doesn't uh, stick around uh, in way it's gravity, so you don't see it. But then you also get oxygen. So you have hydrogen and oxygen, water. So you produce this hydrogen and oxygen in the surface ice, and that then comes off. And the oxygen is heavy enough to hang around in Rhea's gravity, the only gravity. And you can form uh, an oxygen exosphere. And that sort of thing is seen in lab experiments. And so we were wondering, Cassini mission, uh, whether we would actually be able to detect uh, an oxygen atmosphere at some of these moons. And in fact, uh, we were able to do just that. CO2 is uh, sort of interesting because where do you get CO2 from water ice on the surface with the source of carbon somewhere? So as best as we can tell, it has to do with the carbonaceous components and contamination um, <clears throat> in the surface. It also reacts with uh, the hydrogen and oxygen in the solid state chemistry and then gets ejected forms an exosphere. The weird thing is that, so we flew past here in 2010. You see oxygen, carbon dioxide. First of all, it's already a little strange because the carbon dioxide peaks. This is the dashed line is the closest approach here. It's over the North Pole. We're coming in from the night side to the day side. Carbon dioxide peaks well away from the closest approach. We think that the reason for that is that the day side uh, is at 90, 100 degrees Kelvin. The night side is down at 40 degrees. So we're sticking the atmosphere locally. The night side is freezing the surface. It's coming off on the day side. So you actually can tell from this flyby that this atmosphere is non uniform. It's concentrated in the day side. You can see some of that in the O2 as well. You see this tail in the O2, which has to do with scale height of the atmosphere. The scale height, or the height to which the molecules rise up into the atmosphere, um, they hit the surface. So an oxygen gets ejected, it gets produced in the surface, it gets ejected or sputtered by the magnetosphere, it goes up, falls back, exchanges energy with the surface, and now that gas is equilibrated to the local surface temperature. The night side is colder, so the gas is more concentrated near the surface. You have a lower altitude exosphere. You have a higher altitude exosphere on the day side. You can see all of that in these, just from this one flyby from these two uh, distributions that we measure. So we figured, great, we've got another flyby coming up in 2011 in the south. It's just the same thing in reverse. We should see the same thing. The exosphere disappears almost. You can, you can barely see it here. You see how it's in the oxygen. And it's all in the CO2. So what happened there? The atmosphere disappeared. You know, we're all the same configuration here, similar altitude. So what's going on there? Um, that's just the same, same thing up close. So, um, you know, we decided to investigate that with some exosphere modeling to see if we could explore it. This just gives uh, diagrams so showing some of the processes that are considered in these models. So these are collisions models. If he's low density, exosphere density is a homogeneous model. It works pretty good. Molecules are ejected from the surface. They come up, they hop around on the surface. The model is sticking with it. So taking into account um, the binding energy and the vapor pressure of the species at the local surface temperature. It's a thermal model embedded in this thing. Um, molecules can stick for some period of time and they can come off continue hopping around until they either leave of their own accord gravitationally, or uh, they can get ionized by interacting with the Saturnian plasma, and then they get pulled out that way by ionization. You can do other things like adding flumes in here as well. We're not doing that here, but this just shows an example of that. And so this is what happens. So um, model agrees. According to the model, you get this drastic change. The exosphere builds up. It's predicted to collapse between these two 
these two fly lives. So what's the explanation? Well, the explanation is that it's a seasonal thing. So most of the time, one of the poles, one of the poles is in this phase of 14 years of darkness. It's a polar winter, it's polar is radiating out of the space, and the poles can get so cold. Um, the prediction is that the poles can get down to 20 degrees Kelvin, even less, which is cold enough to condense oxygen out of the atmosphere. So you build up oxygen at the poles, and then when the sun rises uh, over the pole, that material comes off, and you get this brief surge in the exosphere. So man, how lucky were we? Saturn's orbit is 29 years around the sun. How lucky were we between these two flyways to actually catch that, catch that change? Here's the, the fit of the model uh, in 2010. Um, this blue line just shows the prediction of what we would have seen had we flown this trajectory in 2010. We actually flew it here in 2011. You see that the predicted density, had we flown past the south just a year earlier, not that much longer earlier, according to the model, the prediction is that we see this big peak of oxygen which we no longer see. So we actually caught that event between these two flybys. Um, that's the oxygen. Um, well, I don't have the CO2 one in here, but the CO2 shows something uh, similar to that as well. Um, and this is just a diagram to show how this process works, I'm talking about. So um, the seasons are changing, material um, condenses on the surface. You get this slow buildup material on the surface. So uh, this is a situation showing you very drastic seasons. Right, so the sun is uh, at a very high angle. Uh, the angle begins to the angle begins to change. That we just start here. The angle begins to change. The solar terminator rises and begins to desorb frozen volatiles off of the polar zone. Initially, they just hop back in. Maybe they come off the edge, bounce around, hop and refreeze back in. So you get this. Kind of a focusing of the, of the polar material until that polar zone becomes so small. Now we're approaching the spring equinox that the material has nowhere else to go. And so you get this rapid buildup of the atmosphere. It may simultaneously begin refreezing in the south as the south is cooling down. You get this rapid buildup, and then the south gets cold enough to refreeze it out of the exosphere and the process begins again. So you've got this exosphere that most of the time is very, very low density with brief periods of explosive periods. So that's why I raised the question about Enceladus, because Enceladus is subject to the same seasons as uh, the other worlds, whether something similar there might happen in the sun and terrain as well. A little different because you don't have gravitational, uh, exospheres are not gravitationally bound. Enceladus is not as massive as the other ones, but still, material is fixed to the surface. You may have a seasonal plume on top of the plume itself it's all really present. Uh, this not only applies to the Saturn system, but there are many other planetary systems in the solar system that are highly seasonal as well. So this is a model of uh, Sharon and Pluto. Pluto's moon Sharon. And so the process there is that methane is escaping from the atmosphere of Pluto. Some of it can get captured or, or um, will uh, impact Sharon as Sharon is orbiting uh, Pluto hits the surface, gives up energy to the surface, and then the methane uh, becomes gravitationally bound. And depending on what point of the season you're in, uh, can after a few pops around the surface, uh, get frozen to the polar solids. And so this is just a simulation showing that effect. And you can see that as the shadow passes over the pole, so that's the material stuck to the poles there. As the shadow comes off, pole focuses, the material comes up, and we get this brief uh, exosphere. How am I doing on time? You're pretty much done. All right. <laughs> There's another projection of it there. Um, yeah, so it's a good place to stop. I have a few more uh, things here, but I've covered a lot of material with it today. So um, I think it's a good place to stop and take any questions that you guys may have. Thank you.
may or may not be possible to take uh, questions from the online folks, but let's start here. Are there any? I, I will ask one thing. In, in your back to your uh, your Cassini instrument argument that CO two or the INMS is a good proxy for water. I understand why water has a lag in the instrument, but why does that make CO2 a good proxy for water as a measure of species? Well, CO2 is much less sticky, but so you have that factor. But it is true that the CO2 uh, being more massive may have less of a thermal spread. Right, as it comes out, I mean, the lighter species, as you may expect, would have more of a spread ejected from the jets, heavier species. So, uh, with the same, so let's assume that all of the species are equilibrated with each other, well mixed, everything, well, the gas is moving out at one average speed. But within that, there's a, a thermal spread. So, the lighter species are moving faster, the lateral components of their velocity. That are quite high in comparison to the forward speed. The heavier species, water being heavier than CO2, will have uh, less of a lateral. So you have to correct uh, for the fact that the CO2 profile, the CO2 jets may appear to be a little sharper than, than the water distribution, even if you could measure the water value, you would still perhaps see a difference between those two species. And if you can correct for that. Um, we assume that all the gas species are being dragged along with each other with the same forward directed bulk velocity and they exit the fissures. Um, that's why we treat it as a proxy for the jets after making a correction. So Ben is here for uh, this afternoon and he's, you're departing tomorrow. If I'm going to leave, if you'd like to talk to him. Let us know. All right. And thank you. Thank you, guys, very much. Hope you enjoyed it.